So what's going on everybody? So I want to do this video and I believe it's one of my most important videos I've ever done. And I'm going to outline some things about the gospel and this is not what you think it's going to be. It's not going to be a snooze boring type of lecture. I'm going to clarify things as it's happening because we're moving into a period in the end times for which there's going to be a lot of apostasy, people falling away. They're going to be promoting things like Biden just did or the guy Biden uh, just did with Transgender Visibility Day on this Sunday for Easter and other people fighting even over what Easter is. Like, are you going to celebrate it? Don't you know it's paganism and all these different things. And I'm going to explain some of this as well as clarify to you the gospel that we live in today and that there's going to be a different gospel into the tribulation and just some other clarifying factors. So I believe it's a good way for me to clarify things, but also just give you what I believe in, because a lot of people ask this question. So they hear things of, of God, Jesus, you don't do this, you don't talk about this, and just so many things. But God has called me specifically to awakening people and building up the church through different means, whether it's encouraging words, prophetic words, whether it's teaching. And in this moment, I'm going to put on my teacher hat. And I'm not gifted in teaching by any means, but you have to know the gospel. and You have to know the basics, but also you have to clarify the nuances because there's a lot of theologians, a lot of Bible scholars, even they are confused, and you cannot be confused in this time. And of course, there are times for which you are wrestling with something. Somebody has taught you maybe incorrect theology. You are just an innocent bystander in the way of your progression in growth. And I'm in that process too. So for whatever reason, maybe God will correct me in certain things, certain verbiages, and how to you know interpret certain things and signs, whatever it is. I'm in this process as well. And so in, in some way, I will be held accountable, but also... In, in another way, I'm a little nervous in that I hope and I pray that God, as he's led me to show you what I believe is revelation, that you can see this from a point of grace, but also that you would do your due diligence yourself. So don't just listen to me and think, oh, everything he's saying is correct, but you want to probe and prod, have your own relationship with Christ, and look at the scripture yourself. So let's talk about what's going on. So first of all, Biden declared a proclamation uh, on Transgender Day of Visibility on the 31st of March, which is today. And so this is not gonna be every single Easter, but rather it's just continuing on year after year for this 31st. And this has caused a quite a stir in the news of people talking back and forth and other people discussing what really Easter is and why we should celebrate Easter, or why we shouldn't and all that stuff. And so let's talk about the part about Easter. Something you have to understand about the church and just anything with regards to any topic at all is that there's going to be spectrums of people, okay? There's going to be people that are either super legalistic about it or they're super libertine about it. So legalism, meaning it could be a pharisaical thing, it could be a very a strict thing versus uh, like a very technical thing or versus a very free thing. So there's, and I'm not saying either one of these in, ex, in, uh, in some form of just out of love and grace is incorrect. You got to have a balance, but you can't be super one way or the other. And this is what's happening with something like Easter. People are saying, like, why would you even have church and even say happy Easter? Ha ha. And they're being very super legalistic about it, talking about it. And, and a lot of us, we understand what's, what it is, right? So Easter... The people that are on this side will say it's very bad. You're, it's a reminder for paganism. You're talking about Ishtar and eggs. And again, you can do all this research yourself. This is all, a lot of this is paganism, right? Pure paganism, like fertility worship. You go into what Easter, Ishtar means. It's a, it's a similar uh, sound there. And just all these things. There's a big history about it. And then on the other hand, people will say, well, if you do anything that's a reminder for Christ, it's good. So just let it be. Let people come to Easter, go to church and do these things. Let's have the Easter egg hunts. And, you know, but people in some sense are mixing the participation. So you're doing things unknowingly and maybe in some naiveness that is promoting Ishtar and these things, but also mixing it with uh, Christ. And, and they're also taking out certain words, like let's take out resurrection. There's been this big discussion about, oh, let's just talk and say happy Easter, like it's culturally normal and just a big fight among people that are looking at terms and just saying, hey, let's say for what it is versus trying to be politically correct. And what you've got to understand is that you need a balanced view, but more importantly, you have to see it from the eyes of God. And so balanced view is things like, okay, should we say Resurrection Day? And again, I'm not saying this is what you've got to do, but this is where people are trying to meet and mend things for which you don't want to say Easter, but you also don't want to say, you completely take it out, right? And again, I'm not saying this is the answer. This is how people are trying to attempt to balance and correct things 
Because the thing that matters, first and foremost, is the gospel, which is the good news of salvation that by, in this period, that by faith alone in Jesus Christ, that uh, you believe in his death and resurrection. And this is the atonement for which you can have your sins forgiven and be reconciled back to God. And as long as you are preaching that, and you are fine. And so we'll go over some of these verses here in a second. But the idea of how far can you do you go? Like if you're going to question Easter, do you want to embrace the Gregorian calendar? Like this is the whole fundamental system of time that we live by. And this is not biblical in the sense that they changed it. Like the Gregorian calendar came up after Christ. You could even talk about the English language. Should we go back to Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic? Or should we continue speaking English? Should we pronounce the, the right name of Jesus Christ or not? Right? So this is these are the types of technicalities for which people are on edge. And where do you draw the line? Right? So this is the question that a lot of people ask. But you have to ask yourself, in what way, and we'll take a look at these three verses, in what way do you want to consider certain aspects of grace, of the, what the purpose is behind Easter and just trying to outreach, the focus, the growth, right? So these verses talk about these things. Mark 9, 30-41 was a story of when Jesus was asked, should we permit this guy who was casting out demons in your name because he was not one of us, right? And Jesus answered and said, "Who those who are not against us are for us. Don't just leave him be and let him do his thing, even though he may not know exactly what it is that I taught you, but let him do his thing, emphasizing inclusion over e- exclusion based on a specific group affiliation. So Romans 14 also talks about the weak, the strong, and these things, accepting differences in practices among believers, focusing on faith and not judging others' convictions in disputable matters. Galatians 5 talking about freedom found in Christ, warning against using freedom as an excuse for self-indulgence and emphasizing love and service. And so there's this whole balancing act you've got to consider. So what is this trajectory, this growth trajectory I'm talking about here? Well, Here's the thing, right? If you don't know the gospel and you're lost, then you don't do any of this. You don't do Easter. You don't, you don't believe in church. You're not for any of this stuff. But if you've grown a little bit and let's say you come to Christ and you go to church and you say, oh, happy Easter. Let's celebrate Easter. Let's talk about Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. And again, all, even all of that, there's questions about the three days. Is it Friday, Thursday and all this stuff, right? So we can get technical about it. But the point here is that if you're here, then by grace, by the grace of God, and Christ just allowing people to be who they are, if even if it's baby milk Christianity, that they are not, there's a naiveness for Jesus. So let them be in some sense, right? So Christ would look at that, and you apply Romans 14, Galatians, Mark, and you just say, let them be. Let them be. Let them worship me. Whoever's not against us is for us. So let them be in the way that they think is best. They will grow. And if they grow, they may correct and fix things. They, they may try to be more educated. They may try to be more balanced. Maybe maybe they'll, they'll try to change their service name to saying Resurrection Sunday worship. Maybe they'll change things and not do Friday, but Thursday and just all these things, right? So there's things that people are trying to do to overcome what would basically be a, a, a one-sided and the other you know, as you saw on the last slide, what it would be on either side. So how do you execute this according to the Holy Spirit leading, right? So this is what you've got to realize that's happening in this time. And again, on this channel, we talk a lot about the current times, where we are at and what's going to happen into the end, right? So there's 7,000 years of human history according to the Bible. And each one of these is marked by specific periods of different dispensations. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But basically, the good news, the salvation, how you can come to know God or be saved during this time. And before this, God existed in eternity. There were millions of years between here, Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. And again, I'm not going to discuss that and, and go into this. But then during this time of all of what we know as the Bible, we are about here. We are here right before the 6,000 years and that there's going to be a millennial kingdom. So again, I'm not going to proof all of these things. I'm not going to tell you that this is how I got to this conclusion. This is basically one of the views, and this is, I believe, the correct view, and this is what will happen. And you can do your own study if you want. But the the big thing you've got to understand here is that there is dispensation. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about how you have to rightly divide the word of truth. There's 7,000 years of exact human history in 2 Peter 3 through 8 talks about how a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years and just various things you can uh, you can study based on this and that the calendar is wrong. Daniel 7, 25 talking about how they will try to change the dates and the times. And what we know of today 
And again, I think that there's exactly 7,000 years uh, before the end of the time and the end of the millennial kingdom. So as you can see here, we are in the church age, the age of grace. At, in, at exactly 5,993, there will be a rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture. There will be a seven-year tribulation. And then we will move into the 6,000 completed years following the Armageddon, Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. And then we will start the millennial kingdom. And in between that, the Bible talks about that uh, halfway through the tribulation, 3.5 years, there will be an abomination of desolation. We will, during this time, have the third temple rebuilt. And this is what Jeremiah 30, I believe, verse 7, talks about as Jacob's trouble. And this is when the Antichrist will rule. Halfway through, he will be a man of sin, and then Satan reincarnated to be son of perdition. So you can study this stuff, but this is where we are at. And there's this question of how much time is there between now and the pre-trib rapture. Now, we are at a calendar, the Gregorian calendar, that says we are at year 2024, or whatever that means, right? But I believe that whatever this real number is, it's not what it what we think it is. Like exactly 2024 years after, right? Christ, uh, the the time period of Christ. Because if that was the case, then we should exactly like we are 24 years behind in a sense. So in some sense, some of the dates and times were changed, and it's confusing a lot of us. And I, I believe that this is what God had prophesied. This is what was known to have happened, and this is how it contributes to the confusion of this end times because God, he's a precise God. He's going to do things exactly the way that he says in the Bible, but the times and the dates and the calendar is wrong. So that's why whatever year we are in, and I believe we are a little bit of a ways out. A lot of people think it's very soon. And again, I can do some briefs and in my opinion, debunks on that. But some people, a couple hundred years, which is where I stand, and other people saying very, very soon, as in like next year or in the next couple of years. But I believe there's still a lot to be done. So this is sort of the outline and the calendar. So that's that. All right. So now let's talk about the distinct gospels that are in the Bible. Now, if you go to theology school or seminary, you will learn about like five different basically gospel or good news throughout the period of everything from the Old Testament through now. Now, I believe there's like seven. Other people believe there's seven because seven is like a good complete number. But they will talk about things like everything from uh, you know, looking at the snake to be saved to various other things. And then also everything that happened in the Old Testament for which you had to do works to be saved. And we all know that you have to sacrifice, you have to uh, uphold laws and commandments. And if you don't and you slip up, you have to atone for your sins, take a unblemished lamb and all that stuff. So they had to really fight with their own power to be saved. And there are other times for which, like with Abraham, he was saved because it was accredited to him as righteousness for what he did uh, prior. He was saved by faith, but his, his faith was perfected by works later on when he offered uh, his son Isaac, right? James chapter 2, verse 21 to 23 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought uh, with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And just as a quick reference, I'm going to read everything in King James Version. So I know a lot of people are going to nitpick at stuff, but I believe that if you study it in the, uh, in the King James Version, you will have a close reference to the original meaning. And I know other Bible translations are used to help supplement uh, but anyway, th that's my take on that. And so there are things for which other people did in the past. But then when Jesus came, right, Jesus, what happened in the beginning uh, that you have to understand is that Jesus began teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews, right? Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, or rather Mark 1, 14. After that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he talks a lot about the kingdom of heaven. And so this is different than what Paul taught. Paul taught was, uh, it was a, a revelation that was given to him by Jesus, but this was after Jesus was rejected from the Jews. And so this is also then different than the tribulation gospel, which I'll talk about, and which is preached by an angel according to Revelation chapter 14. 
So the gospel of the uh, of heaven or the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. This is Paul's gospel. And then the, the everlasting gospel is what is being preached in this time. And so I'll explain this here in a second. So let me just bring it, put it all out. The gospel of the kingdom, right, or the, the kingdom of heaven being at hand is what Jesus taught. And let me say this all this out first, and then I'll explain one by one. Gospel of the grace of God. And this gospel is what we live by today. And I'll talk about this gospel as well. Because this gospel is what Paul taught to the Gentiles and the Jews as well, because they rejected what would uh, have been the ushering in of the millennial kingdom very early. So this 1,000-year rule would have come in early had the, the Jews accepted Jesus during this time, for which when he was on earth physically and said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is what is basically the temple of God that's indwelling in us right today. And in the everlasting gospel or in the tribulation period, this gospel, which is the gospel of the kingdom, as referenced again in Matthew 24, verse 14, it will be preached to all the world for the for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So Matthew 24 talks all about the end times, meaning in the tribulation period. And this is also in combination with some other things. So I'll explain that here in a second. So the gospel, Jesus' gospel, is about who he is. Okay, this gospel is for the Jews. And for the Jews, they had to receive Jesus as Messiah during this time. And everything was done in the name of Jesus. If you read all of the gospels, a lot of what they talk about is doing things in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus saves. The name of Jesus is what rules and has authority. That's why there's a lot of uh, miracles, healings, and wonders. During Paul's gospel, what's happening right now is that, and Paul calls it my gospel. It was given to him in Revelation, right? He, he And we'll go over some verses here in a second. But what he did was it was faith and belief in Jesus. You need to have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by understanding that his death and resurrection is what will atone for your sins so that you can be reconciled to the Father. And so you must believe in that. All you have to do is believe that he did this for you, that you are a sinner saved by grace, and that the only way to him and in and, and salvation is through this message. And this is what we know today as the gospel. And in the uh, tribulation period, there's going to be a different gospel for which you have to not only proclaim who he is, right? Not what he did, who he is, because you had a chance. If you lived during that time, you had a chance to believe in what he did. So that's why you are not raptured. Since you're not raptured and you're not going to heaven during this time, 5,993, you have rejected what he did. And instead, what you've got to do instead is that you have to have not only faith, but also you have to do some works. And so that's why in this gospel period, you have to do some things for which you can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation if you do not endure to the end. In fact, let me just go over it very quickly. So in Revelation chapter 14, in verse 6, it says that, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, or, or give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And so what you've got to do during this time, and let me read another verse, Revelation 22, verse 14, says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of the life and may enter in, uh, through the gates into the city. So the works that you have to do is that not only do you have to fear God, give him glory, and worship him, but you have to have faith in Jesus. And as it says in all, many parts of Revelation, that you cannot take the mark of the beast. You have to and also die as a martyr for Jesus, whether through beheading or just surviving and enduring to the end. So if you, it says running to the mountains, right, away from this whole system that they live in. And it says, and again, you can do a Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with, in, without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And there's many other verses like this. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, Revelation 19, 20. And they all talk about the same thing. And so again, I don't have time to do a deep dive here, 
But this is what I believe, and this is what many people believe, is a separate gospel in the end times. And so you have to realize that in the Old Testament and before Jesus, it was that God, he dwelt among us. That's why there was a temple, there was a holies of holies. That, that's why there's an inner area for which it's, there's a desire for you to be clean before the Lord. And you have to do all these rituals, all the Levites, they did rituals because there was an area for which God dwelt among them, not directly with them, like as an in them, but among them. But what changed with the gospel of the grace of God is that because uh, the atonement of uh, Christ Jesus and what he did, his death and resurrection, he's able to then dwell in us. The Holy Spirit can dwell in us and the, the temple of God now is in us. So this is what's different than what was before. And because this is different, then we are we can have direct access to God. Now, in the tribulation gospel, this is where it gets a little iffy, but once the Holy Spirit leaves with all the people that were saved, now there's a there's this thing where God will dwell, dwell among us and in us. So we see it like with the two witnesses, they were filled with power and the Holy Spirit and they were doing awe and wonder. So the Holy Spirit will be there, God will be there, he will d- dwell among them. But because the third temple is built and that they have to try to basically establish Christ as uh, as king, anyone that does that, then, and again, this is going to be a crazy scene, guys. This tribulation period is something that we we will never, ever see again, as the Bible says, and we, we, we can't fathom what it's like. So it's going to be absolutely a crazy thing, and you don't want to be there during this time. That's why uh, Jeremiah 30 talks about sparing them, right? And this is Jacob's trouble, that he shall be saved out of it. And so there's many other, again, that's proving pre-tribulation. We could talk about many other verses that talk about how pre-tribulation rapture is the way to believe what is true. And so there's many verses talking about uh, the, the gospel of what uh, P- Jesus preached, the kingdom of heaven, to the Jews, and what he said to the Jews, ushering in the kingdom of heaven early versus what Paul preached because, again, because Jesus was rejected and the Holy Spirit was rejected through Stephen in, um, in his last sort of effort, because of that, I think like 70 years or, you know, something afterwards, this is when, and again, I'm not here to like time frame exactly what part of Acts and all that, that this is ushered in, but it's very clear that when, when Paul was brought in, and these are many verses we can go through, where he references this. So what is the gospel according to Paul? Because you, you've you got to know this gospel and you also have to know, and again, I believe we won't be here during the tribulation period, meaning that it will be a few hundred years away, but it's good to know. But the gospel you have to know right now is this. So Galatians 1, 11 through 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached for me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. So this was given to Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is a summary of this gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again by the third day according to the scriptures. Romans 1, Uh, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so this gospel that Paul started preaching is actually for everybody. It's for the uh, the Jew and also to the Greek. So Ephesians 1, 1 through 13 talks about the Holy Spirit sealing your salvation. So this is that answering that question, once saved, always, always saved. Once you are saved and you are truly born again, in this time period, you will go to heaven. In uh, that verse says, in whom ye also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye are sealed, were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased uh, possession, unto the praise of his glory. So in this time, once you are saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and you will go to heaven. In this period, You have to do some words. You can lose your salvation. Your your name can be blotted out from the Lamb's Book of Life. And you could not endure to the end. You could cave and you can take the mark of the beast. You can not worship him. You can declare him as not a god and all these things. And you can lose your salvation. And something you have to understand here is that there's always a blood sacrifice, an atonement. 
right? So before Jesus, there was the lambs, and you have to pay for your sins, right? You pay for it. Jesus, when he was preaching, he was preaching about him uh, being Messiah in the name of Jesus, in some sense forecasting what would be basically his death and resurrection. But imagine this. Imagine what would have happened if they embraced him as Messiah, right? So how would you be saved? Well, you would be saved by receiving him as Messiah and in the name of Jesus. During this time, because he had died and rose again, things changed, and he was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the one that basically took it all, paid it all, and because he was an unblemished lamb, he can pay for everybody, for all mankind. And that's why his blood was enough. Now, in this period, you have to pay for something. It's not through Jesus. It's through what you've done. So that's why uh, when you are martyred and you're you're beheaded, then that will be enough. And in addition, all of these works and also believing in Jesus and declaring him as Messiah and, and as king, right? When you do that, then you will be saved. So this is what this gospel is about. And again, I'm doing a flyby and you could people could be like, oh my gosh, that sounds theologically crazy. Like, what are you talking about? But you can do your study on your own if you are interested and I could, you know, break it down. I could do that as well. But the point here is that there are distinct Gospels. And so this is what I wanted to talk about today. And if you have questions, maybe you can leave it in the comments. But I may not directly come back to this for a while. But I want to at least uh, present it and put it out there. So there's many teachers out there. You can just Google this or go to YouTube and just try to study this yourself. But this is what you've got to do. You have to study to show yourself approved unto God. And this is 2 Timothy 2.15. But you've got to do this to understand who God is and what the gospel is. So I know this is long, but hopefully this was helpful in in some sense. And again, I hope I did some justice to this. If I misspoke in some way, Lord, please forgive me. Uh, I I just tried to rush through this because I don't want to make this too long. But also, if there's anything as I look back on this, I will try to clarify if it seems relevant, pertinent to what is at hand now, which is that everything is being distorted. Everything is being suppressed. Other uh, ungodly things are are overtaking this gospel, but this also from a theologian and sort of a nitpicking point of view, there are things that you can question and there's other things for which you don't need to fully know to have salvation because, again, you don't have to be a super big intellectual person. As long as you believe, you have faith in Jesus of what he did for you, then you are saved. So this is the gospel that we know of today by the grace of God in grace and in faith by faith alone not of works, but uh, by the grace of God. So love you guys. Talk to you guys very soon.